Uh, we drove down from uh, Boston today. If you, if you uh, haven't figured it out yet, that's where I'm from. And uh, we left in a torrential rainstorm uh, about 7 o'clock this morning. And, and uh, about uh, uh, Connecticut cleared up pretty nicely. We went over to George Washington Bridge into uh, New Jersey, and the heavens opened up again. So uh, <laughs> it's kind of a harrowing experience, but anyway, we made it. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. And my wife, Joan, um, as Noel said, um, I, I spent 30 years in the Navy. Joan spent 20 years in the Naval Reserve. So uh, we, we have, I hate to say it, but 50 years of service between us. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you know, the character development program, I'm sure you've learned a lot about it this morning, and uh, you've got some real experts in the room, but um, this, this came about about six or eight years ago, um, where somebody, some wise person, might have been Jack Jacobs, um, said, you know, uh, the qualities that are embraced in the Medal of Honor are qualities that uh, children and men and women uh, all over the country should be following, and uh, let's start something to, uh, to implement that and start up right here in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, did a great job and now it's uh, taken off. Uh, I'm trying to get it implemented up in Boston, up in <clears throat> my neck of the woods. Uh, we're having our annual Medal of Honor convention next September, September 2015 up there. And uh, uh, to help get ready for the convention, we're trying to uh, get the character development program up and running up there. Uh, we have a meeting um, in a few weeks with the Secretary of Education for the state. And uh, we hate to be dragging behind the other states, but at the moment we are, but we hope to get it going. But um, I, I think uh, the training that, uh, that you're receiving today uh, and, and the stuff you bring to the table to let the uh, Medal of Honor folks and um, the CDP people know what's on your mind, uh, it's, it's tremendously useful to improve the program even more than, than what's, going on, what's been going on in the last few years. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I don't know what was in the video, so I might be repeating myself, but uh, I <laughs> was born and brought up in Boston, and uh, from, the, from the time I was uh, a little boy, maybe six or seven years old, um, my uncle took me to uh, visit uh, USS Missouri, the battleship, uh, which was uh, just was the, the site of the uh, Japanese surrender in World War II a couple years earlier. And it was visiting up there in New England, and. Uh, uh, my uncle took this little six or seven year old boy and I walked aboard and I saw, you know, the sailors with a hats on the back of their head kind of going like this and uh, the 16 inch guns and uh, I said, wow, what a, what a life, I want to be one of them. So uh, it was always in the back of my mind, sometimes in the front of my mind. So when I got out of high school, getting out of high school, I really wanted to, uh, to go into one of the sea services, Navy, Marine Corps, um, Coast Guard. So, I applied for uh, Naval Academy, Coast Guard Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, ROTC, and I got shot down in every one of them because uh, my eyesight was lousy, uh, 2200 or 2400 or something like that, so I, I just couldn't get in. But four years later, when I was graduating from college, uh, I heard about this program called Officer Candidate School, and uh, the standards were not uh, quite, um, quite as rigid. Uh, speaking of eyesight, um, I told you that I couldn't get in because of uh, my lousy eyesight. Well, 10 years later, uh, I was in Vietnam, and I think you saw the uh, video of the action I was in. And as a result of that action, I was, I was hurt pretty bad, and uh, I lost my eye and uh, a good bit of my skull. And uh, so the Navy said, we don't want you uh, because you lost an eye. And in those days, um, um, if you lost a limb or anything like that, um, an eye, ear, whatever, uh, they kicked you out, and uh, nowadays, fortunately, uh, uh, the military has seen the wisdom of its ways, and they're allowing people to stay with uh, missing one limb, two limbs, even three or four limbs sometimes. Uh, and psychologically, of course, that's terrific for the individual involved. But anyway, uh, after I lost my eye, and they said, you got to go home, I, I fought it very hard. And uh, to make a long story short, um, I, I prevailed upon when they allowed me to stay for t uh, 20 more years. I had a normal Navy career at 30, 30 years old together. But the ironic thing is I, I couldn't get in uh, when I was trying to get in when I was a kid because uh, my eyesight was 20 to 100. Uh, and uh, you know, 10 years later, um, my eyesight was still 20 to 100. 
and I can only see out of one eye, but they let me stay. So, <laughs> so it, that brings me to a, you know, perseverance. Uh, during my life, uh, there were several uh, opportunities I had to persevere, and that was one of them, you know, kind of taking on the system and refusing to take no for an answer. Um, uh, what, I, what I enjoyed uh, mostly during my uh, 30 years in the Navy was the, uh, the teamwork. Uh, nothing gets done in the service of the Navy or any of the services or any institution in life, I suppose, without teamwork. It was particularly important on a, on a ship where you're out in the middle of the ocean and uh, if something breaks, uh, you know, you can't call a, a local repairman to come fix it. You're on your own, uh, sometimes uh, a week or more away from the nearest lands. Uh, so the team really has to be, be uh, on the same page. Um, we train, train, train over and over again. So. When I was in Vietnam and I acted the way I did on June 15, 1969, it was because of the training I'd been having uh, over the previous nine or ten years. And things kicked in uh, instinctively. I acted and I acted. And uh, so did the men in my unit. Uh, they, they repressed the enemy attack and uh, got us out of there. And it was due to the training that all of us had gone through uh, over and over again before that. Um, Education has always been a, a huge uh, part of my life. My father was a school teacher. Uh, my brother ended up as a school teacher up in Boston. And um, I was blessed by um, being able to go to a Jesuit high school and a Jesuit college up there in Boston. And um, they, they taught me, the Jesuits taught me about service to others, uh, taught me about integrity. Uh, they were tough, and so tough that by the time I went to go to boot camp, and go to the Navy, a piece of cake after going through eight years of judgment education. But I had one guy, I was a little wise guy when I started off, uh, 13 years old, uh, going into the ninth grade. And I thought I knew it all, of course. And I walked into my homeroom teacher my first day at school, and there's this little short guy, uh, his name was Charlie McCoy, and he turned out to be a homeroom teacher, and a couple of people were mouthing off. Charlie just went over first day of school, just grabbed him and put him up against the wall. I know you can't do that. <laughs> and that, that set the tone right there. But Charlie, Charlie has been a, uh, he was a heck of a football player. He, he'd gone to BC High, my high school. And um, then he went, he was a quarterback in the football team, and he went to Boston College. And he was there one year, and um, he uh, dropped out and um, joined the Marine Corps enlisted man in the Marine Corps, and he went to China, uh, China Marine, right after World War II. And then he came back and he finished his three years, of, his three more years at Boston College. He was quarterback in the football team. He was about, about this tall, but wiry and tough as nails. And uh, anyway, Charlie was my homeroom teacher. And, uh, you know, we, we, first of all, we were terrified of him. Uh, he was also a football coach. We were terrified of him, uh, but we, we didn't want to do anything to let him down, because that's, that's what an impact he had on us as a, as a mentor. And we, I, I'm still close to a lot of the fellows I graduated with, and we still feel that way about Charlie. We let our lives uh, say, would Charlie approve of what we're doing right now? It, it sounds kind of trite, perhaps, but uh, it stayed with us for the rest of our lives. Uh, he later uh, became a priest and um, joined the Navy, was a Navy chaplain, for uh, 30, 25, 30 years or so, and I was wounded up in Vietnam, got the purple hat, and then, uh, passed away a few years ago. But, uh, you know, talk about a guy having an influence on my life, and I'm sure uh, probably everybody in the room has somebody that they can look back at and say, uh, gee, if it hadn't been for that person, I wouldn't be here today. But Charlie was that guy for me. <clears throat> and, um, Um, one of the things that uh, is, is terribly important in, in your field and in my field is uh, leading by example. And uh, I know I've always said that sailors are they're not dumb at all. And students that you deal with, they're not dumb at all. And you can get up there and say, do this, do that, do the other thing. And if you don't uh, live your life the way you expect them to, they're going to tune you out. And, uh, 
you'll be totally lost as a leader. And I think, uh, I think that applies across the board. Um, and I've also, also felt that, um, you know, the physical courage you hear about when you hear about the Medal of Honor, uh, you hear a lot about physical courage. People running up hills and taking out machine gun nests and this, that, and the other thing. But to me, the more difficult and challenging uh, kind of courage, moral courage, that anybody can do on, on a daily basis. I just spoke to uh, <clears throat> a group of about 50 uh, high school boys and girls down the hall. They're having a symposium on, on leadership. And I, I walked in and just said a few words to them and said hello to them. But uh, I pointed out examples of uh, uh, moral leadership, how they can do it in their own lives. To, to see another kid being bullied over there or something, uh, go up and step in and do something about it. Uh, if somebody gives the answers to a test or something ahead of time and offers them to you, say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and he, examples every day. And, and you don't have to be uh, wearing a uniform. You don't have to uh, be in the military service. Uh, you can just be an ordinary folk like, like we all are, all were when we joined the, joined the military. There were a couple of notes here. <clears throat> If, if, uh, if, if your uh, your students, when they read about uh, me or other Medal of Honor recipients, uh, you know they, they shouldn't focus on the, uh, the the physical aspects of the particular act, uh, the traits, the qualities of, of um, service to others, um, integrity, honesty. Uh, those are the things that make make, make us do the things we did on the battlefield. And uh, again, you can do that every day of the week. Uh, teachers can do it, children, students can do it. Uh, <clears throat> the opportunity is there. The <clears throat> character development program um, is a great start. We have another program called the uh, Citizens Honors Program <clears throat> in the Medal of Honor Society that uh, we find people across the United States, ordinary citizens, who have done something extraordinary to past year or so, uh, to save somebody, uh, to stand up and be counted, to perform an act of moral courage. And we bring those people to Washington, uh, three or four of them every year, um, on Medal of Honor Day, which is March 25th. And we, we the Medal of Honor Society, actually gives these people uh, an award. And uh, one year was to a school crossing guard, a woman up in Massachusetts, who uh, uh, dived in front of a uh, uh, a, a car to save a uh, child who was in the crosswalk and the bumper to run down. She was killed, but the child was saved. So we gave that award to her uh, her family. Another boy out in California last year, uh, he ran into a burning house and uh, you know woke up the people. Not only woke them up, but went room to room and dragged them out. And he was 15 years old. So these acts are going on all the time. Those are acts of physical courage. But I'm sure this young boy, 15 years old, he probably had time to think about it. And so I think uh, what he did was an example of both physical and moral courage. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, questions and answers, and uh, maybe it'll lead to some more discussion if uh, you ask something that'll remind me of something else. So the floor is open. Now, what do you do when, when none of your students will raise their hands? <laughs> probably yell at them, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, what expectations do you have of, like, as a, as a Medal of Honor recipient and, um, like, a, like a, a example for all these wonderful, uh, all these uh, values, uh, core values, and uh, what, what expectations do you have for young people today? Well, I, I think uh, what, what this particular program tries to teach, and you're going to be out there uh, on the front line, is that uh, uh, these, these core values, uh, uh, they can be practiced by anybody, uh, student, teacher, uh, any ordinary citizen. And uh, it, it's so important to be able to look yourself in the, in the mirror every morning and, and know that uh, you know, uh, you're going to be acting with integrity that day. And, and uh, that's the message we're trying to get across. Who serves on the committee that reviews? Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> we, we send out uh, to the various governors, I think, around the country, and then people get nominated and they, uh, a group at Medal of Honor Foundation uh, kind of winnows through 
them, and now it's a number down. I know I was on the final selection board uh, two or three years ago, and I think I had 10 uh, to review, and I could pick four. And it was really, really tough because every one of them could have gotten it. Yes, ma'am, the corner. Can you tell us about the ceremony when you received your... <clears throat> the ceremony. Uh, I, uh, I was with about 10, about 12 other people, because this was back during Vietnam, and they gave quite a few medals of honor, awarded very, uh, quite a few the, during that period. And uh, I was here at the White House with uh, my wife and three little kids, and my mother and my brother, uh, and 12 or 13 of us uh, also. And we were in the East Room, which is, uh, I guess, the biggest room in the, in the White House. So we're all arranged around the wall in a semicircle. And President Nixon came in, and uh, it's kind of, I don't remember much about it, to tell you the truth, because it was kind of a fog. You know, it, it's kind of awesome to be there, especially for a, a young, youngish guy. Um, anyway, he, he came to each person, shook their hand, put the medal around, around their neck. Somebody read the citation, and he moved on to the next person. Well, in my case, he finally came to me, and he said, where are you from? And I said, Boston, sir. And he said, oh, do you eat baked beans every night? <laughs> and I said, no, sir, only on Saturday. And he said, huh? And he walked on to the next <laughs> So that was, that was my, uh, my dialogue with the president. <laughs> Not the warmest guy in the world. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it, was a fun, it was a fun experience, and I, as I said, I. A lot of it's just a blur right now. I've, I've gone back uh, twice in the last few years for uh, Medal of Honor recipient uh, presentations. With actually, uh, three, uh, three times. Two of them were uh, posthumous, which is uh, kind of a somber moment down there. And then just uh, a few months ago, I went down for uh, uh, Staff Sergeant Ryan Pitts, United States Army, who just got the uh, Medal of Honor for his action over in. Um, Afghanistan, and he's actually a neighbor of mine, and he lives in uh, New Hampshire right across the border from where I live. It, it was a lot more relaxing uh, the last few times I've been there, to tell you the truth. Yes, sir. First, thank you to you and your wife for your service. You set a great example for all of us. Um, all of us in the room as educators serve in a leadership capacity in one way or another, whether it's as a principal leading staff in the community or teachers and classroom students or peer team. So my question for you is, through your experience in the United States Navy and particularly the experience that led to you earning the Medal of Honor, what sort of um, insight or advice would you have for us as leaders in terms of how we could steer our group into the right direction? You know, certainly much of our industry is tumultuous these days and you know, we're, we're hoping to lead youngsters the best way we can. Well, I, I think, uh, as I briefly mentioned, uh, students, uh, they're pretty perceptive, and just like sailors and Marines are pretty perceptive. And uh, they know when you're trying to cut corners. Uh, they know when you're doing something that you're telling them not to do. Uh, and they know that. They, they, they really do. And you lose all credibility. So I would say, uh, you know, live your life. Um, uh, have them lead, live, live your life as you expect them to lead, you'd like them to lead this. But <clears throat> going beyond that, um, um, build, build a sense of teamwork among your, among your, uh, the people you're working with, student body or whatever. Uh, everybody's striving towards the same goal, teamwork is huge. Um, and get to know, get to know the kids, uh, get to know their private lives. Uh, it's difficult, I know, sometimes, and especially in a school setting, but uh, without being intrusive. But the more you know about a, a, a child or a person, uh, the better you can um, adapt uh, your way of dealing with that person. Um, I, I received an award last week, by the way, from my, my high school uh, up in Boston, and uh, one of the recipients of the award, a couple of us, was a teacher the track coach and the teacher at that school had been in 47 years. And his, his remarks when he got the award uh, were how he went out of his way, and this, again, this is all boys school, Jesuit high school, private, out of his way to find out about the kid's home life, uh, what challenges does the kid have when he, when he leaves the school that day or before he comes to school the next morning. 
Uh, what's it like to be in his place overnight or whatever? Uh, how's the commute to school? Is it uh, through a tough neighborhood or uh, things like that? Um, and he was, he thought he became much more effective teacher by, by being able to do that. Yes? You mentioned your three children, so I was wondering, um, at what age did you start talking to them? Oh, well, I, uh, I was in the Navy, again, uh, uh, they, they were born in the first five or six years I was in the Navy. So they grew up uh, moving around the country, going to different schools, and making new friends, and this said the other thing. Uh, they didn't really, uh, we didn't talk about the Medal of Honor at all, really. They were there at the ceremony, and uh, <laughs> uh, there's one picture of us standing there. And they all looked really, they all looked really, really angry. And they were like six, five, and four years old or so. And I guess it's because they were very tired or something like that. But uh, you know, um, my my grandsons, um, I got two of them. They live right up the road here in uh, Hoboken. Uh, they didn't, they didn't go to uh, public school. They went to uh, St. Peter's Prep up there. But uh, they, they 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 were more attuned wanting to know more about the Medal of Honor than uh, my kids did. Maybe my kids already knew it and but it didn't, it was no big deal to them. But um, I, I went and talked to uh, my grandkids' uh, school a couple of times up there in Hoboken, talked to a group of children like that. But, um, you know, they, they, took, they took it in stride. They didn't like the Navy because it kept, you know, take, taking me away for long periods of time and making them change schools, uh, stuff like that. So they, they turned out okay. <laughs> Um, since you were a younger fellow when you uh, when you when you received the award and you still had a long career after um, you you were a Medal of Honor recipient, um, I guess my question would be, what impact did it have on you? Did you did you feel a sense of um, responsibility or a duty? Did it change how you interacted with your um, with your fellow officers and your fellow servicemen? And I, I, I tried to downplay it as much as possible. I. Um... <coughs> Um, as I said, I had 20 more years, and uh, I was still the same person I was before, and I knew I had to prove myself in whatever job I happened to be in. The Medal of Honor means nothing when you're, you know, uh, driving your ship across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and, and I suppose some people could try to take advantage of that, but uh, fortunately not to me. But uh, I was just the same person, and I, uh, I was on ships that nobody, nobody in the ship knew I was a Medal of Honor recipient, and uh, that's fine. Yes, ma'am. We were told today that the initial nomination comes from your peers, which I think is quite an honor. Were you aware of the nomination initially? Not, not until uh, just before um, I, I got it, actually. Uh, I was actually up in, I was stationed in Hawaii at the time, and um, <clears throat> I was back east at, uh, in Rhode Island for a, uh, a training course for, for a week or two. And uh, I, was, I was in this. Uh, in a battle problem in a mock-up. And um, somebody came in and said, hey, there's a phone call for you from Washington. And you know, I was just a young uh, young lieutenant at the time. I, I didn't know anybody in Washington. And I went over there and uh, the guy on the other end says, uh, this is so-and-so, and we want you to be in Washington uh, next Tuesday, but we can't tell you why. <clears throat> that was really strange. And, and uh, they said, we'll take care of your family, we'll fly to Hawaii, and you can be in there and all. And, uh, then it, it leaked out that uh, I, I, somebody else called, a friend of mine called down in Washington to find out what's going on. But the story was that this was right after the Cambodian invasion when, uh, when they sent the U.S. troops into Cambodia in 1970, I think it was. <coughs> and uh, uh, Nixon was really uh, under siege in, in the White House at that time. <coughs> that was before Watergate and all that stuff, too. But anyway, they literally had to sneak us into the White House uh, because they didn't want to upplay or publicize the Medal of Honor uh, or, or anything military. So uh, that's why they were so hush hush about it. And they said, You can't tell anybody. Well, of course I told everybody. <laughs> <laughs> of course I did. You know? <laughs> can't just say, Hey, I'm going to Washington. I can't tell you why. <laughs> anyway, and a few of my friends in the area came up from Norfolk and places like that. And they weren't able to go to the ceremony, but we had a chance to uh, have, a, have a beer or two. <laughs> Yeah, you can raise your hand. No, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Could you tell us about somebody you served with in Vietnam that 
it's inspired you or you got to observe their, their character? Good question, and uh, one comes to mind real quick. When I was uh, in the middle of this firefight, uh, I, as I said, I was uh, hurt pretty bad. And uh, next thing I know, a medical aid boat uh, comes alongside my boat right in the middle of the firefight, and this little short uh, Navy corpsman hops on board, and uh, he starts on the exposed side of the boat. You know, the Browns are still coming in. Uh, he uh, started ministering to me, he put a conference on me and this, that, and the other thing. I don't know what he did, but he, he saved my life. And uh, I'm still in touch with him. He's, uh, he's uh, older than I am, he's 80-something uh, 80, 80 years old. And I just re learned recently that he never was recognized for, uh, for his actions that day. Because I, I had been medevaced out of there and uh, I left the unit and I never went back to it. And then the unit disbanded uh, shortly thereafter and we all went on separate ways. I found out that he, uh, his name was Richard uh, Doc Nelson, and he'd never been recognized. So uh, several months ago, I started gathering uh, some statements from people and rec recalling some of the actions myself. And uh, I put him in for a uh, Silver Star uh, medal, which is pretty high. It's the third highest medal. And uh, it's wending its way through the halls of the Pentagon right now, and I, I hope it's proved. But uh, he should have been recognized a long time ago. Yes, ma'am. Um, you said that a couple of years ago you had to uh, wing through like 10 people to come up with three uh, finalists. Mm. Now, yeah. those that weren't chosen, can they be submitted again at another time? I, I don't know the answer. Uh, um, is, is Noel in the audience? <laughs> Do you know the answer? Um, I suppose they could. I suppose it could be. Yeah. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that Yeah, one, one of the uh, recipients a couple of years ago was a, uh, I think a priest or a minister from San Diego who had just spent his whole life on the streets trying to help uh, people with substance abuse problems and homelessness and stuff. But he'd been doing it for years and years and years. And uh, so that was kind of a meritorious thing rather than a specific uh, heroic action. Did you ever go back to Vietnam? Either? No, no, I, I never went back to Vietnam. A lot of my friends did, but in fact, uh, one of the guys, the guy that was a boat captain on that boat that couldn't get its ramp up uh, that particular day, his name was Mike Harris, lives out in Oregon. And he went back, he's been back two or three times, and uh, he, he runs tours over there, I guess, for veterans. But he went back uh, a couple of years ago, and he went to the same spot where that ambush took place uh, on the Ong Wong Canal down there. <laughs> and he said the Viet, Viet, Vietnamese have erected a monument there to the brave Vietnamese soldiers who, uh, who uh, devast laid devastating uh, harm to the Americans that particular day, June 15th, 1969. Well, the only guy really hurt bad was me. Everybody else got out of here. <laughs> so there's a mic. I, I, I got a picture of it somewhere. But, uh, <laughs> I guess who, uh, what do they say? Uh, Whoever wins the war writes the history, is that, the, is that what they say? I guess they won that one. Right in front. Right in front. Yeah. Um, my father was on the U.S. Enterprise, CBN 65, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, he was a flight deck director. And I can tell you how, um, from his perspective, how he felt during that time. Um, what was it like for you? Uh, during the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, at that time, I was on this uh, real tub of a boat. Um, it was a converted uh, landing ship from World War II, and they had welded up the, the bow doors uh, to, uh, so it was no longer an amphibious ship, but they put uh, heavy equipment and shops on the, on the, on the deck. And our job was to repair other ships. And so uh, we were home boarded in Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, came time, everybody in the world got underway to go to Cuba, and this was exciting, because we never did anything exciting like that. So we got underway with all the destroyers and carriers and this, that, and the other thing, steaming down there. We all got down there, and uh, they were getting ready to launch weapons and shoot guns and stuff, and our assignment was to go around 
to each of the ships and pick up the trash and garbage every day. And so we, we were so unhappy about that that uh, we just groused about it the whole time. But uh, it, it was a pretty scary time. It really was. And, um, you know, looking back, uh, I guess it was the closest we ever came to a nuclear uh, holocaust. Yes, ma'am. Well, it seems that the Medal of Honor is, is such an honorable award. It sounds like from your story, from some of the other vignettes that we watched, there are so many people who go unnoticed. Oh, yeah. Do you Absolutely. have any ideas on how to change the way that we recognize everyone's efforts? This is very well, concerning to me as a counselor. How do you recognize There, there is a hierarchy of, uh, of awards, if you will, uh, the Medal of Honor being the highest. but um, the. the I guess the criteria uh, for this one is that, um, first of all, it has to be against the enemy uh, in, in armed combat. Secondly, you have to be a member of the military. Um, and uh, I, I, I heard something one time that, uh, that if you didn't do what you did, if I didn't do what I did, then uh, I wouldn't have been caught martial or anything like that, you know, it just, uh, went that step beyond. But, you know, as I tell everybody, and I told the children next door, the students next door, I wear this thing for the, you know, like people like your father, 16 million uh, men and women who have served and uh, did great things, ordinary things or great things, because they're all ordinary people, and uh, just were not recognized for it. Um, they do go back every now and then and, and review uh, some people who didn't get the award, for example. But 20 years ago, uh, uh, the Army did a review and found out that there were a, a dozen or so um, um, Japanese Americans who had served in World War II in the 442nd Regiment over in Italy. And uh, they did some great things. And uh, a, few, a couple of them got the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the second highest award. But they went back and reviewed them, and they, get, they decided that about five or six of them should have been awarded the Medal of Honor. And one of them was Senator. Uh, <coughs> Sort of in, in a way from uh, Hawaii, and uh, they did the same for uh, uh, some Jewish soldiers from World War II. Uh, you know, in those days, and I was telling the kids that, that it's hard to believe, but you know, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, people were not quite as enlightened as they are these days. And uh, a, a recommendation would come up to a senior officer or somebody, and if he didn't like the person because uh, he was black or Jewish or anything, just throw it away and tear it up. That, that happened, uh, and they, they've actually found cases where people admitted they did it or somebody witnessed them doing it. And so again, uh, we just gave a, a award of the medal, uh, the president awarded the medal uh, uh, within the last year to a Vietnam vet from, um, from Vietnam, an uh, African-American guy. That had happened to him. They, they, lo they lost the paperwork. You know? Yes, yeah, I just want to know, how, how often do you get to, to bless people with your presence? <laughs> well, I get to bless uh, my wife with my presence every day. <laughs> Most days, anyway. Uh, well, I guess as often as we want to. Uh, the, the foundation, Medal of Honor Foundation, with its uh, CDP program, is, is always looking for somebody to step up, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you, some people are probably a lot more eloquent than I am, but uh, I, I get to go around, uh, pick and choose, really. Uh, we're going out to uh, uh, Los Angeles, well, we're going out to Philadelphia uh, tomorrow for a Marine Corps thing in Philly uh, over the weekend, and I'll probably have to say a few words then. And then we're going out to uh, Los Angeles in a couple of weeks for Veterans Day, probably have to say a couple of words then. But good thing about that is we have two children out there, one in San Diego and one in Los Angeles, so we'll be able to have a little vacation too. Yes? May we hear a little bit about your wife's service as a reservist? I'm sorry. Did, 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 did we hear uh, a little bit about your wife's service? Oh, by all means. <laughs> you got a couple hours? <laughs> oh, you want to say? Well, Joan, um, she, uh, her uncle, was a Naval Academy grad, uh, class of about 48, I think. And um, 
he served two or three years in the Korean War on a ship, and her father was a soldier in, in, um, in World War II. And uh, when they invaded Italy, when the Allied troops invaded Italy, uh, they used him as an interpreter because his family was from uh, uh, Sicily and southern Italy. And uh, I guess uh, Joan always had an um, interest in the Navy. Uh, she liked the uniforms for one thing. Um, used to go to the Army Navy game down in Philly and stuff like that. And then uh, when she, uh, she went to Emanuel College up in Boston, and I think at one point she was entertaining thoughts of going into the, into the Navy then, but her parents didn't feel it was a proper place for a woman to go, I guess. <laughs> and so she waited and got a master's degree in public relations from Boston University. And at that time, the, uh, she's also an attorney, at that time, the uh, Navy was looking for public affairs officers. They downsized too rapidly from Vietnam. So she got a direct commission, which is really unusual. Spent 20 years in the Naval Reserve, a lot of, a uh, couple of years on active duty, and then the rest on going to uh, tough spots like Brussels and Naples and <laughs> places like that, Bahrain, and, uh, on her Naval Reserve duties. She was in a Desert Storm, mobilized for uh, the Pentagon. So that's her Navy career. Yes, sir. Sir, I don't want to open up a whole can of worms here, but before you leave, could you pose for a picture with our department? <laughs> Which is your department? The whole room? Uh, right here, but I swear to God. Yes, we want Yeah, he'll be around for a picture. Yeah, thanks uh, for your time, really. Enjoyed it. Thank you for what you're doing. Very fast.